Hello everyone and welcome back to our online classroom. For today, we are going to talk about the Cognitive Affective Personality System or CAPS. This is an integrative theory by Walter Mischel. Alright, so last time in the other videos, I was able to discuss trait psychology, trait theory, such as the five-factor model, and we were able to understand what is being, what trait psychologists are trying to prove by quantifying personality, by administering self-report tests or measures. So going back to trait psychology, they do assume that in order for us to understand the personality and the behavior of the individual, we need to quantify these traits because it is expected that these traits will manifest in almost all situations, in every situation, all right, in the different situations that we encounter every single day. However, not all scholars out there agree with what trait psychology is trying to say. So one example would be um, the perspective of Walter Mischel. He doesn't really believe that we should only look at traits in order for us to understand the uniqueness of the person, the behavior of the person. That's why he gave more importance to cognitive affective units in our personality. So today we're going to take a look at these units and we're going to understand what is the role of these cognitive affective units in trying to understand, predict, and perhaps even modify human behavior. All right, so before we begin, let's have some overview first. So like what I told you in the introduction, some theories such as Isenck and Allport, they do believe that behavior was mostly a product of relatively stable personality traits or disposition. So in other words, they do believe that in order for us to understand the human person, we need to look at the traits of the person and we need to, um, and from that we will be able to predict how will a person behave when he or she is placed in a certain situation. However, Walter Mischel objected this assumption. His early research led him to believe that behavior was largely a function of the situation. Before I ended my discussion in the five-factor model, I, I told you that trait theories are less likely to believe that situations are the ones that explain our behavior. I told you that personality psychologists place more emphasis on traits while social psychologists place more importance on the role of the situation. So we can, um, in this discussion, we're looking at Walter Mischel. So he's criticizing the perspective of trait psychology by saying that if we want to know how a person will behave, let's not only look at traits, but also we need to take a look at the features of a certain situation. So what makes that situation unique? What makes that situation different? in contrast to other situations. All right, now let's take a look at the consistency paradox. So Michel saw both laypersons and professional psychologists seem to intuitively believe that people's behavior is relatively consistent. However, right, empirical evidence suggests much variability or changes or inconsistencies in behavior. And this is what Michel labeled as the consistency paradox. So how does, he, how does his proposition, how does his beliefs differ in contrast to the propositions of trait psychology? So basically, if you're a trait psychologist, you would assume that an extroverted person is supposed to be an extroverted individual in all situations. However, for Michel, there might be situations in which you are sociable or there there might also be situations in which you are quiet and some trait psychologists would say that that's not supposed to happen but for michelle he would say that there are changes in our behavior not because of mistakes and prediction but rather there are changes in our behavior because we should also look at the situation if the situation changes then the behavior might change as well. 
because situation A may not be the same with situation B. That's why it's a paradox. You are consistently different in various situations. So he contended that some basic traits do not persist over time. Okay, that's because that's what um, that was being claimed by trait psychology. So it doesn't really believe that they do persist over time. But little evidence exists that they um, generalize from one situation to um, another. Okay, so unlike what trait psychologists are trying to say that traits are supposed to manifest in all situations, uh, Michelle is convinced that it's hard for us to say that an extroverted person will be extroverted in all the situations that he will be placed in. That's um, because he placed importance in what we call the person-situation interaction. So he acknowledged that most people have some inconsistency in their behavior, but he continued to insist that the situation has a powerful effect on the behavior. So it's not just traits that we should look at. We should also look at the situation. How does it influence your behavior, your attitude, in that situation. So for example, a student may have a history of being consensuous with regard to academic work, but fail to be consensuous in cleaning his apartment or maintaining his car in working conditions. So a trait psychologist would say that that's not supposed to happen. If he is consensuous, then he is supposed to be consensuous in all situations. However, for Michelle, he would argue that it's okay if you're not consensuous in all situations because situation A is not the same with situation B. And that is, once again, what we call as consistency paradox. All right. So here is the framework that uh, Michelle proposed in the papers that they have published. So basically, it may look intimidating at first, but let me explain it in a way that you would easily understand. So basically, um, for example, behaviorists would argue that situations are the ones that um, predict our behavior. However, in the perspective of Michel, he would argue that it is not the situation itself that produces behavior, but rather there is something in between and these are what we call the cognitive affective units. In other words, before you do something in a certain situation, first you think about what you're going to do, unlike what behaviorists are trying to say. That's why um, in his papers, we can see that the cognitive affective units are labeled as mediators. For those of you who are very good in statistics, you know what mediators are. So let me explain what mediators are for those who are not um, familiar with this concept. When we say mediator, these are the things that come in between. So they bridge um, concept A and concept B. So instead of situation directly predicting behavior, these mediators come in between. So specifically, okay, what Michel is trying to say is that there are um, um, some sources would say five, some papers would say six, but I think most sources would say there are five. He would argue that there are five mediators or cognitive affective units. These are the things that come in between. All right. And these are the different mediators such as encoding, expectancy values, goals, affects, and behavioral scripts. In some um, papers, I didn't really see behavioral scripts, but in some papers, um, they've included the behavioral scripts. Anyway, we can talk about this later on. But first, let me go to the leftmost side of this illustration. So basically, um, Michelle is trying to tell us that situation A is different in contrast to situation B because um, there are different features. There are different components in a certain situation. For example, your behavior when you're with your mom is different when you're not with your mom because um, obviously the components in situation A has changed. Your mom is no longer present in situation B. Now, let's take a look at these um, cognitive affective units. So basically, um, according to Michel, before you produce or before you decide how you're going to behave in a certain situation, first you process it, you need to think about it, and as we go along this discussion, you're going to understand what are these five mediating units. So, okay, so um, in my studies, I'm familiar that there are five encoding expectancies, values, goals, and affects. 
But eventually, I think they have included behavioral scripts. So I think what they're trying to say with behavioral scripts is that we have certain patterns that we follow depending on the situation that we are in. Okay, so for example, there might be situations in which you are no noisy or in which you are very sociable, but there are situations in which you're very quiet. For example, when you're praying, you're supposed to be quiet. That's your behavioral script. But when you are playing outside with your friends, um, back when you were children, then you're very loud and you're very sociable. It means that um, that is your script in that situation. And then later on, we can talk about the other mediating variables here. So basically, um, once again, what Michelle is saying is that situations um, help us. Um, first, we look at situations and we process what is the meaning of this situation. And that's when we decide on how we are supposed to behave in these different situations. That's why different situations may produce different behaviors and we don't behave similarly in all situations. Okay, so why? Because um, Michel believed that variations in behavior can be conceptualized in this framework. If A, then X, but if B, then Y. So in other words, for example, if I am in school, then I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to behave. But if I'm with my friends outside, then I can be myself. So that can be one example. So if, if the situation changes, so does the behavior. But remember, it's not only the situation. We also have some cognitive affective mediating units that allow us to process or try to understand the situation. What does it mean to us? So for example, if Mark is provoked by his wife, then he will react with aggression. However, when he when the if changes, so does the then. For example, if Mark is provoked by his boss, then of course that has a different meaning. That is a different situation. Then he will react with submission. So same situation but different reactions because situation A is different in contrast to situation B. So now, um, before we proceed with the different mediating units that I showed you earlier, let's take a look at some assumptions here. So Michelle proposed that there are five overlapping, relatively stable um, variables that interact with the situation to determine behavior. So in layman's term, perhaps what's, what he's trying to tell us is that um, our beliefs, for example, will interact with the features of the situation. That's why we have different behaviors in different situations. So later on, we can have more examples. Second bullet, these person variables shifted the emphasis from what a person has, in other words, traits, to what a person does in a particular situation. That's like what I told you earlier, Michelle gives more importance to the situation rather than traits. And these cognitive affective units include um, psychological, social, and even physiological aspects of people that cause them to interact with their environment with relatively stable pattern of variation. Or in other words, you are um, consistently different okay, in, the, in these um, different situations that you're in. So now what we can do is that we can take a look at these five mediating units, these five cognitive affective units, and try to understand them one by one. Try to relate with my example so that you'll be able to understand why am I different in situation A compared to situation B? So first encoding, um, first uh, mediating variable or first um, cognitive affective unit would be our encoding strategy or in layman's term, how did you encode the situation or event? For example, is being touched by a stranger the same as being touched by a partner? So if your partner, for example, a husband, a wife, or a girlfriend or boyfriend touch you, then you might interpret it as romantic. But if a stranger is touching you, then you will interpret it as creepy. So um, you will behave differently depending on who's the person um, touching you. Okay, so that's one example. Second, when you fail an exam, do you encode it as a failure or as an opportunity to improve? And that's how we differ in contrast to um, one another. Some people think that it's um, they're a failure, while some people think that it's an opportunity for them to improve. And another example, if someone insults you, will you react angrily or will you ignore it? Of course, you would say that it depends on the situation. Basically, that's what Michelle is trying to tell us. 
our behaviors depend on the situation, but it also depends on how we interpret or encode the situation. All right, so um, you need to pay more attention on how you encode the situations. Perhaps you have some, your mind will take some shortcuts, for example. Perhaps you sometimes you will jump to conclusions, just like what is being um, talked about by the proponents of cognitive behavioral therapy. Sometimes we jump to conclusions that we are worthless. Sometimes we jump to conclusions that nobody loves us. So we need to be aware because our encodings, our interpretation, um, partly determines our behavior. Next, our competencies also influence our behavior. So do you think you'll be successful in what you're doing? For example, a person may be confident in joining a local basketball competition, but he may not be that confident in trying to join the NBA. Of course, we're talking about something big here. If you're going to join the NBA, you might be confident if we're talking about local basketball, but joining the NBA is something um, different. It's something, um, it's very challenging in contrast to situation A. So your behavior in these two situations will be different. A person may feel confident in one subject, but not in another, because you think that you're competent in one subject, and you think that you're not that competent in the other subject. All right, so that also influences our behavior. So that, that's why there are instances in which a person will work hard in mathematics, but he will be easily frustrated, for example, in arts, because he has um, low ex, ex, um, his competencies in that subject it's not that high okay he thinks that he will not really he doesn't really expect that he will be successful another way um to another type of competencies and self-regulation would be our um, self-regulatory strategies so just like bandura uh, michelle believed that people do not require external rewards and punishment to shape their behavior but rather they can set goals for themselves and then reward or criticize themselves contingent upon whether their behavior moves them in the direction of those goals. So in other words, he doesn't really believe what um, behaviorists are saying. He believes what Bandura is trying to... Um, he somehow agrees with Bandura by saying that you don't need rewards, but rather you're the one who choose your own um, behavior. You're the one who regulate your own behavior. And we do not just look for rewards when we do things. That's why it's called self-regulation. All right. Anyway, so now let's proceed. Another mediating variable would be our expectations, our beliefs in a certain situation. For example, our hypothesis or beliefs concerning the outcome of any situation is a better predictor of behavior than is knowledge of um, the ability of the person. For example, a student preparing for a licensure exam may think it's a difficult one because of his previous experiences in taking exams. So your expectation of what will happen in the future is partly influenced by your past experiences. If you want to know more about what I'm saying, I suggest that you go back to the theory of George Kelly. Like what I told you, the theory of Michel is integrative. He tries to combine different perspectives so that he'll be able to come up with an integrative view of the human person. All right? So, also, you need to pay attention to your belief. Do you believe that, um, that you can improve after you failed on something? Or do you believe that failing on something is, um, is a permanent roadblock? That's why Carol Dweck spoke about what we call the growth mindset, as well as the fixed mindset. People with growth mindset believe that they can continually improve, but people with fixed mindset are convinced that abilities are fixed and they're no longer going to improve. So we differ in contrast to each other with respect to our beliefs. Our beliefs are very important in determining individual differences. Another type of, um, another one under expectancies and beliefs would be our out stimulus outcome expectancies or what we call, for example, conditioning. For example, Michel believes that stimulus outcome expectancies are important units for understanding classical conditioning. For example, a child who has been conditioned to associate pain with nurses in a hospital begins to cry 
and show fear when she sees a nurse with a hypodermic syringe. So he also incorporated some of the perspectives of classical conditioning. That's why this is a an integrative theory. All right. So um, basically, what this integrative theory is trying to tell us is that let us not be confined by one theory in understanding the human person, but rather we need to try to marry, try to combine, try to integrate the various theories that we know in order for us to understand the behavior people in various situations. We also have what we call um, goals and values merged into one slide, but they're supposed to be separate. But anyway, so when we speak about goals and values, so people do not react passively to situations, but rather we are active and goal-directed. And we differ in contrast to each other because we also have different goals. We have different values. So two college students may have equal academic ability and also equal expectancy for success in graduate school. However, what differentiates them? The first, however, places more importance on entering the job market than going to graduate school, while the second chooses to go to graduate school rather than pursuing an immediate career. So they have the same ability, but they have different values. All right, so that's why we behave um, differently in contrast to the people around us. And finally, he didn't forget about the role of affect, feelings, emotions, and he believes that um, our emotions overlap with our thinking. For example, if you say something like this to yourself, um, I see myself as a competent psychology student and that pleases me. So if your belief makes you happy, then you're going to maintain that belief. But let's take a look at the second example. I'm not very good at mathematics, and I don't like that. So if you say that you don't like this belief, then it only means that you're going to do something about this belief. Then maybe you're going to change it, right? So that's why we have cognitive behavioral therapy. Another example of the role of affect in our behavior is that when you're panicking, when, you're not, um, when you are not in the right state of mind, you're not thinking um, logically, then you're going to be impulsive in the things that you do. But if you calm down, think about things for a while before um, making any decision, then you're going to be more rational. That's why we, we try to tell people when they're angry, try to calm down first before you do anything because your feelings influence your behavior. All right? So going back to this, Basically, um, just to review what we talk about in this discussion, Michelle is telling us that um, different situations produce different behavior because um, we attach different values, goals, expectancies, interpretations or encodings, as well as feelings to different situations. For example, you may be excited in meeting up with your friend, but you're not that excited if you're going to meet someone that you hate because we have different um we have different um feelings in different situations we have different interpretations we have different expectations you may choose to pursue a psychology because you expect you may choose to pursue um psychology because you know that you will um succeed in this course and that is also the reason why you chose not to pursue other career other courses because you know that you're not expecting any success in those areas. For example, what if you're not that good when it comes to um, art? Then you're not going to pursue a career in art. If you're not that good in mathematics, for example, then I doubt that you're going to pursue a, a career in mathematics, for example, education. All right. So we basically what Michelle is trying to tell us is that we differ in contrast to each other, because we have different encodings, expectancies, values, goals, affects, and even behavioral scripts. But let us not forget that we do not only differ in contrast to other people, we also differ, okay? Our behavior is also different in various situations. If trait theories would argue that these differences or variations are um, something that is not supposed to happen, Michelle will tell us that it's 
expected because your behavior is not just a product of your traits. It's the product of the interaction of the person as well as the situation. So that's it for this discussion. Let me know if you're going to have some questions so that we can talk about them in the comment section. If you have any requests for um, any topic that you want me to discuss in theories of personality, make sure to let me know about that. That's it. Thank you. See you next time.